Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, artist, and writer. The Appetite is all about issues of food, body, sport, and mental health. And on the podcast, we have had all sorts of people in here, people that lean more towards artists. We've had people that are coaches and dietitians and psychologists. And today we have something a little bit different. Um, We have an animal in the studio. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Opal co-founder Lexi Giblin is here with her dog. Zoe. Zoe. Ah. Hi, hi, Lexi. Hi, Zoe. Hello. Zoe's looking very chill. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually giving me the side eye right now, which Aww. is very funny. Yeah. <laughs> so will you describe Zoe for those yes, that haven't met her? of course. Her? So Zoe's been our therapy dog at Opal for the past three years or so, and she is a really small Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with Blenheim coloring. What does that mean? It's like a chestnut and white color fur. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, I see it. <laughs> and <laughs> I haven't heard Blenheim she's before. She's been hanging out around Opal for the last three years and kind of works at Opal in different capacities <laughs> as a therapeutic animal. How um, old is she? She's she's going to be four in July. So she came to Opal as a babe. Yeah, she a was five baby. months old when she started her work uh, at Opal. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. So she's been a therapy dog, and she takes Tuesdays off and Saturday, (laughs) Sunday. She loves Opal, loves to be there, and has offered all kinds of therapy to our clients and staff, I think. Definitely. I've gotten to hold her at some really nice moments, too. She's very soft. Uh (laughs) (laughs) So um, what was your initial thought when you started bringing her to work with you? I got this dog for my daughter, for her holiday gift and then you know I guess it just felt like well wait a second I work at a clinic and we need a therapy dog at the clinic and I have a great therapy dog and it just all made sense it was more of a flow thing versus uh I you know I need to set about finding a therapy dog it just all kind of came together and so she's turned out to be quite a therapist (laughs) <laughs> this one. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she's over time, it's been really fun to see how Zoe's changed as a therapist and as a, I was going to say as a person. <laughs> as she's changed as an animal over the years, as she's gotten more emotionally expressive. I oh. think that's as her, as her parent, I've seen her get more and more expressive over time as a result, I think, of being at Opal or just being live and in the presence of people who are emoting. So she's very expressive emotionally. I feel like I'm having these like empathy exchanges with her. And sometimes I see her doing this with clients too. And I think that's one of her gifts. You can project all kinds of things onto animals and what they may or may not be feeling. But the way I like to think about her is that she's having empathy and having emotions back and forth with the person she's interacting with. How do you see that play out? What does she do? She'll moan. So I'll see if she'll do it right now for us. Sometimes it'll happen. Hi, sweetie. Let's listen to your other when you're emoting earlier. Okay. Huh? Sweetie. she's feeling so this is she does this a lot and she'll do this when i just start talking to her like engage with her she starts to do this sweetie are you having feelings i love you i love you (laughs) so when you start talking to her she starts responding Uh and is it a particular (laughs) is it a particular tone that you're taking i think i kind of talk start talking like baby talk with her and start to say, I love you, and looking at her and kind of doing this, and she'll start to... Like nuzzling against nuzzle her. Nuzzle and, and start to express emotion. My read, and 
I don't know if the listeners will have heard this or not, but my read is that, you know, when she hears sort of the emotive sound, even of her own voice, she is both mirroring herself and also now mirroring the tone of your voice. Mm -hmm. And it's striking because the way that she just emoted feels sort of sad and Mm -hmm. also... I mean, like, it's not like a let me make you giggle. It's definitely a sound that makes you feel more. Yes. Which is really striking to think about a dog actually, like, bringing that out of someone, potentially. Yes. Matching it and maybe illuminating it. Yes. Right. So that's how I feel when I hear It's like she's communicating something really deep. Like a longing or a yearning or a deep mourning or something when she makes those sounds. So anyway, I think she, you know, she's just gotten more and more expressive like this over the years. With clients at Opal, when they're leaving and she wants to go, she'll mm. have emotional expression tantrum. Like, I'm having separation anxiety. Don't leave me. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. My response, first of all, to that is that Again, it's interesting that with a therapy dog, I'm often assuming that the dog is responding first to the human. And with Zoe, having been around her for three years myself, I feel like she elicits so much response from the humans. Uh Like if she's the one expressing the separation anxiety, then maybe the clients are then able to feel a different kind of connection or a different sort of affection for Zoe or she's sort of naming something that's in the room like uh-huh. oh don't go uh-huh. I don't want to be I don't want to be disconnected <laughs> uh-huh. and I think you know she's very honest dogs are just there's a trust that you can have of their expression I think that's part of what makes animal assisted therapy so rich is that you can trust in their expression and in you in the bonding therefore is strong because mm. you can trust what they're communicating mm. I want to go back for a second and just hear a little bit more from you about what animal-assisted therapy is. Like, is that just therapy with the dog around, or is it something <laughs> specific? Yeah, so it could be therapy with a dog around, because just having dogs around can be helpful in therapy. But it can also be using the animal as part of the therapy. And I can give you some examples of what that's looked like at Opal with Zoe One of the main ways we use her is in treatment of anxiety. So, for example, in post-traumatic stress disorder treatment, she's been used as a kind of exposure therapy help. When a person's doing prolonged exposure, she's been in the room or been held by the person doing prolonged exposure. So the and what is prolonged exposure? Yeah, so it's, it's going to memories of trauma. And talking about the story of trauma, the stories of trauma and the memories of trauma. And part of the work is pairing those memories of trauma with current safety. Because a person's no longer in harm's way, even though they once were. And so part of what Zoe can do in that scenario is offer safety. You know, the opposite of of threat is Mm -hmm. in my lap. Wow. She also has been helpful in mirror and reflection exposure work for body image. Oh, um, so. A couple of weeks ago, she was taken on a therapy session where the client was looking at herself in reflections of mirrors or reflections of windows and used, she looked at Zoe when she felt anxiety, when a difficult emotion came up about her reflection. She had Zoe right there and would kind of check in with Zoe as she did that work. And what do you think that did for her? My assumption is, or my hope, I guess, maybe, is that when she looked at herself in the mirror and had an uncomfortable experience of some sort, distress, that she then looked at Zoe or had some grounding with Zoe and that impaired, a relaxing oxytocin kind of hit with something that's distressing so that she can then learn to access safety when she's feeling distress. So kind of more of a development of that coping tool while also being able to take in something of warmth and even connection as she struggles with finding warmth and maybe connection to her own body. Yeah. I think Zoe's also been great at 
providing like, heat off experiences for folks who are over controlled or who have a lot of anxiety with a lot of heat on and with a lot of questions coming at them or a lot of focus on them. And so heat off would be the opposite of heat on. So how would you describe that? So like Zoe becomes a distraction sort of in the room. It takes the heat off of the client and we can then focus on Zoe for a moment and look at her or be with her. And the client kind of gets a break from being on stage or being the one that is a focus. Mm. Yeah. Zoe's also been helpful in family therapy. There's been times when a family member has been willing to come in for family therapy because she knew that Zoe would be there and we'd be able to have Zoe available to her during the family therapy. So there's some neat ways that Zoe's been used for anxiety and in trauma treatment and family treatment and such. So. One thing I've noticed about Zoe's personality, and she's doing something a little bit different right now, she nuzzles between your arms <laughs> and barely moves, is that she's really rambunctious at times. Mm-hmm. And at Opal, your office is near the kitchen where so many of the clients are hanging out and moving around and a lot of actions happening. And there have been so many times where I've been, you know, with a client or in the room next to it, in the great room, and Zoe's little head has peeked (laughs) through the window or through the door. She sort of runs through at this sort of heavy moment. Uh And not only would I describe that as it being like kind of heat off for a second, but it also brings a kind of levity and playfulness to an otherwise very serious moment or experience, either with, you know, sort of difficulty with food or a meal or a really, yeah, just kind of rigid conversation where someone's feeling kind of black and white about something, Mm -hmm. suddenly she shows up and maybe causes a little chaos or a little (laughs) playfulness and really changes the mood. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. She can really shift the dynamic quickly when she enters the scene. You know, she is really playful and she's also very emotive and kind of has a lot of seriousness to her, but she's also playful. And I think that's one of the ways she brightens the space at Opal is that she does a great job of art of non-productivity and just (laughs) plays around, romps around and follows her kind of pleasure all the time. Our clients, you know, of course, tend to struggle with feeling okay about seeking pleasure or feeling pleasure. And having a dog around who is all about pleasure, I mean, that's pretty much all she's up to from moment (laughs) to moment is wanting to do whatever it is she wants to do that feels good. It's such a neat contrast to what clients are used to. So for someone that doesn't have access to a therapy dog, I'm imagining just animals in particular, whether someone has a pet or is able to go to a pet store or a shelter or something to even have some contact. That would be such a helpful, soothing experience in life. Yeah. They just make life a little better. <laughs> if you're if you're an animal person, that is, and I totally respect when people are not, but yeah, they just seem to make life a little better. And you know, I think that the oxytocin that gets released in us when we see a cute baby or cute animal or pet an animal. I think that the touch is a big part of what Zoe offers too, is a a safe being to touch. And she also offers mindfulness to our clients. You know, she is a mindful doggy. So she's right here as as most animals are, right? That they're they're right here right now. They're not really thinking too far in the future. They're not thinking, you know, about memories of the past, they are in the moment, and they invite those around them to be also in the moment and be mindful right along with them. So sometimes we'll use Zoe for mindfulness, and we'll do what we call mindfulness of Zoe, where we we observe Zoe moving (laughs) around the space and kind of just notice whatever's coming up for us. She's not self-conscious. She's not too concerned about what others are thinking about her or what We may be thinking about why, you know, her pursuit of a particular food on the floor or she's just moving from pleasure experience to pleasure experience. Mm. Love to love. Yes. (laughs) Fun to fun, you know. Yes. One of the things I love about Zoe at Opal is how I get to see really soft, sweet sides of our clients and staff, too, because they come in and they everybody talks kind of baby talk to Zoe and (laughs) 
there's a softness that people bring to animals that maybe they don't into other aspects of their lives. And because I'm you know, next to Zoe, a lot of the time I get to see these really sweet, soft, you know, sides of of people. I just get to be around a lot more love, I would say, because people just feel a lot of love towards animals. And that is pretty amazing for my own therapy. I know. I was going to say that would be a really good case for someone that needs more of that in their life to get a dog (laughs) and be sort of attached to this cuddly creature that people want to be around. And then by proxy, you get connected in a different way. Mm -hmm. One thing that kind of this conversation about Zoe has reminded me of is equine therapy. Oh, yes. Am I saying that correctly? Equine, equine? Equine. Equine, I think. Equine therapy. (laughs) Because that is an activity that the clients at Opal do Mm. periodically and I've gotten to go with them a couple times, mm-hmm. too. And there's something really different about a horse rather than a dog, but some similar experience there. Right, yeah. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting when I've been with clients and the horses has been when we've done equine therapy, we've gone to Kirkland, and there are a handful of horses there and they all have really different personalities. Typically we're working with two or three at a time and we're asked by the therapist there to choose a horse that we feel drawn to. And it's fascinating to watch who picks which horse and to wonder why. Uh And to even hear kind of, I was drawn to this horse because they were really playful or I saw this sort of seriousness in the horse and I felt attracted to that or they were really big and it scared me. And so, so much gets projected onto the animal that it sometimes is very much there and then other times maybe not, but can be really worked with in terms of your own experience of attachment, your own experience yes. of sort of what your own emotional need is in that moment. Yes. It's a then to engage the safe being or maybe even intimidating being with wonder and kind of the capacity to have a new experience. Mm-hmm. It's not a human. Mm-hmm. You don't know what they're going to do. They're not judging you. They're not hurting you. They're neutral. Right. And they're nonverbal. Right. <laughs> right. Yes, I think that's a big part of what animals bring to therapy. You know, I think we often interact with animals in a similar way that we interact to humans in some ways, or maybe we're drawn to certain animals be- the same way we are or not drawn to humans. And then you can work with that, the relationship that they have with the animal as a proxy for the relational work they're doing in their lives generally. I love that. Yeah. I know about this organization called Saratoga War Horse mm-hmm. that pairs veterans with retired racehorses and to match uh, someone that's been kind of a war hero or someone that's been in combat in this intense situation to a racehorse who's also been kind of a star and a hard worker. And they, there's actually some similarities. To pair them together can be such a rewarding experience again to sort of identify new parts of yourself and heal mm-hmm. in PTSD. I've heard that happen with kids that have some more behavioral issues. Pair them with a horse that has behavior issues. Oh, yes. Have you heard of this before? No. It's so cool. So oh. then the, the child is able to learn about their own emotional regulation or dysregulation through watching the animal and taking some agency over training the horse and engaging the horse and then is able to learn how to relate to other people based off of their experiences of really tending to the horse's distress because now they maybe have more access to understand their own distress. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. That's beautiful. Yeah. You can see yourself in in the horse. Exactly. Uh-huh. And you get to learn a new way of being with this neutral, nonverbal, beautiful, mysterious being. Mm-hmm. There, there have been times where clients have been really struggling and we've needed to call the emergency folks. And because Zoe is known by clients and sometimes I'll bring her into those kinds of situations and see if she can be helpful in um, helping the client make a decision that could be helpful for them. And one time she was particularly helpful for a client and she rode in the ambulance to wow. the ER and that was really meaningful to see um, Zoe have impact in that way. 
And then I followed the ambulance to pick her up at the emergency room and all the nurses were loving having Zoe there <laughs> and that she can really impact in ways that human other humans can't. We couldn't communicate in the same way that Zoe could on that day with that client. What do you think she was communicating? <sighs> Good question. It's okay. Mm. Mm. Just be with me. We'll be okay together. So sweet yeah. and so simple too. Yeah. Which I think is a relieving thing when you're in high distress, just to have the simplicity of presence mm -hmm. and people get more complicated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it is. There's a simplicity that this brings. Yeah. So if someone doesn't have a therapy dog around, what would you suggest in terms of how to bring some of these things into their life? So can it only be done well, by an animal? Well, I think you can, there are other ways you can make these changes or make, have psychological change that doesn't involve animals. But if you're an animal person, boy, I, I know lots of people who would love animal sitters, people to watch their animals and stuff. <laughs> She's oh, licking gosh, now. So sweet. I know. As we're here at the end of the episode, Zoe has seemed to really awaken from Lexi's lap and is now licking a lot. I don't know what it means, but it seems to be. <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean, Zoe? <laughs> oh, funny. I hope you got that lick in the mic. Um, it seems to maybe be a kiss goodbye from Zoe. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Opal or the services that we provide, the programming, please visit us at opalfoodandbody.com or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you can be aware of our next release. Thank you so much to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetite's original music, and to Hans Anderson for editing. Talk to you next time. I wish she would just bark or something right now. Mm -hmm. What, you have some feelings? <laughs> Zoe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love you. Oh, I love you. <laughs> Zoe. It seems, to, it seems if I play that thing, she really goes. Let's see if she'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh.